Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with none other than Tony Newton. Tony, so good to have this opportunity to chat. As always, we like to go back to the past, because I know you've had a lifetime of so much exciting bass playing and stuff. How did you get started in music and on bass? I had a clock radio, so I would always, that's number one. And I'd always be listening to it, and it would wake me up. And I'd listen to Wolfman Jack, or what uh, what they're playing down south, or Blind Boys on, on Sundays. And so one of my neighbors had a piano. So I would always go over there and play it. However, my parents couldn't afford a piano. So they gave me a plastic saxophone one Christmas. <laughs> and so I played the keys off of that. So then they bought me a real one. I'm still in the age of elementary school. Mm -hmm. So I went, I went through elementary school. I was in the choir. And then when my voice changed, I thought that, that I would switch. So what would happen is, in Detroit, back in those days, they would give you the instruments to take home after school, right? So they started off, uh, they started me off on saxophone and clarinet and flutes and all of the woodwinds. So I played in all of the school orchestras and all city bands and orchestras. Um, and, and that happened all throughout my school days, right? During this time in the early 60s, and this is the time when the transition is being made from the upright bass to the electric bass. Mm -hmm. So you would hear a lot of recordings of upright bass, but then you'd hear the electric bass creeping in here now. So... Keep in mind, this is also the time when music and radio is starting to explode on the airwaves. So I heard uh, both James Jameson and Chuck Rainey and, and uh, Duck Dunn, and I wanted in on the instrument. Uh, so I said to myself that I'd probably stay working longer as a rhythm section than as a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. So I switched over. Moving on, there used to be a lot of Chicago blues players like uh, Lil Walter, B.B. King, Johnny Hooker, and, and these guys, they would come from Chicago into Detroit. So I would always play, I'd start first playing with these guys. My first concert was with Nina Simone, and we opened for Nina Simone. Yeah, that was a great pleasure. And so after that, that's when I started getting more into to the bass guitar. So back to the blues guys. So I was playing with John Lee Hooker, at the time, and Motown was exploding at the same time, but everyone knew that you had to have a connection uh, with, with Motown. Now, I had a connection. Me and David Ruffin, we grew up together and was in a band together. And for those that don't know who David Ruffin is, he's the one that's singing My Girl on The Temptations. Okay. So he was the first one of us that got with Motown. And so I'm playing with John Lee one night, and of course, I want to be with Motown, uh, but there was damn near a studio uh, or a club on every corner, mm. right? And so there was a lot of work that was happening. All the studios wanted to be buried, and uh, the music scene was just happening. So I'm playing the club one night, and Hank Cosby from Motown a and R came in to see me. I didn't know this. I'm just playing, right? And I had no awareness that he was coming to see me or was there to see me. 
And so the next thing I know, the next day, Ronnie White from the Miracles uh, was knocking on my door. And they told me that they wanted me to take Jameson's place because Jameson was on the road with them. Mm. And so, but they wanted to keep Jameson in the studio and at home all the time. So that's why they needed a replacement. So there was no audition. <laughs> I just went and started playing with them. Uh, we, we did some gigs and one of the first gigs we did was the Tammy show. That was the, uh, the movie with Marvin Gaye, the Supremes, the Beach Boys, the Rolling Stones. I think that was in uh, 64. And so that was a, a, a real great gig. But of course, then we did the Apollo. And a lot of people don't really know that the Apollo is only one of a circuit of those theaters. There's the Brooklyn Fox, there's the Uptown in Philadelphia, the Howard in Washington, the, the Fox in Detroit, and all of these are theater circuits that have the show and, and then a movie. And, and that's, and, oh yeah, and the Regal in Chicago. So we did all of those and a, a, a lot of colleges, right? And so it was quite an experience for me because I think I was 16 or 17 at that time. Wow. Now, after we did the Tammy show, then we did the Motown Review in, in Europe. And I played for, uh, since I was the one that was there, and I was playing with Smokey, I played with all of the acts, meaning Stevie Wonder, Martin Vandellas, The Supremes, and the miracles, of course, right? And so that was a tour throughout England, and our last show was at the Olympia in Paris. And that you can find on the Motown Review in Paris. That's on a recorder, right? When we came back from that tour, I started playing, which a lot of people don't know, but if you listen closely, you will hear two bases. There are two bases on Stop in the Name of Love, Where Did I Love Go, Nowhere to Run, Reach Out. And these were some of the first two bases because Holland and Dozier were producing these songs, uh, writing and producing these songs, and they were on to experiment with two bases and three guitars. Hmm. So James then would tell me, Okay, you play the higher part, like on Nowhere to Run. I play boom, 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 and he would play the lower part. Boom, 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 boom. Now, most people don't recognize it because we're so tight, we sound like one player, right? But if you listen very closely, you can hear that there's two basses. And so, all of that went on for quite a while, and I would always be the music director for any of the Motown acts when they went to Hollow, uh, going back <laughs> to that. And, and then when I came home, I would always do uh, lots of recordings uh, with Motown and other labels as well. Because a lot of labels, they knew Barry didn't want anybody to know who the Funk Brothers were, but most people knew, and so, and, and they wanted that sound. So they came to Detroit, and if Jameson wasn't available, then I, I got the gig, right? Nice. And all of that's going on, and then Holland Dozier formed their own company, Invictus and Hot Wax Records and they left Motown and formed their own company. So I started playing on all of their recordings, The Hundred Proof, Honeycomb, uh, everything they, they put out, I was there. And they also gave me my first chance to form a group and be, become an artist, which was the eighth day. We had two hits, She's Not Just Another Woman, and Crawl Before You Walk. Now, they were good producers and writers, but 
And when it came to management and all of that, it was not happening. And so they had the hits, but they couldn't manage things as well as they could be. And so that label kind of fizzles out. And so what happened, I mean, it wasn't only the label, it was Detroit in general, mm. uh, all of the things. You know, I, as you can see in the movie, now I had left Motown about a year before this happened, but in the movie Standing in the Shadows of Love, he put a sign on the door, no more work there. And so, which I, I don't get all these people have made this man rich, and then he's not going to tell anybody that he wants to be uh, a, a movie producer in Hollywood, and so he just puts a sign on the door uh, at Motown in Detroit and moved to L.A. <laughs> right, so after he moved to L.A., now I had been coming out to Los Angeles uh, with Smokey, we came out here at least two times a year, and so I had connections out here. Detroit was kind of fizzling out after the, uh, l let's say, all of the car manufacturers were going down because they ignored Toyota and the Japanese manufacturers, so Detroit kind of fizzled out as far as work. Because people from all around the country are coming to work in, in the auto factory. And in fact, I'm a Ford baby. My father worked in Ford all his whole life. Well, wow. uh, right. There's so much information in me, and I'm trying to keep it all together. So, as Detroit is fizzling out and the bars are closing up and not as many recording sessions, I, I'm going to move to Los Angeles. Cause I don't want to move to New York because of the weather or, or down south. And Los Angeles, I have connections, and I like the weather. And so I moved to Los Angeles. When I got to Los Angeles, I think that was 75. And so they all wanted the Detroit South, right? They had lots of bass players there that could play sort of like the Detroit sound, but once I got there, they knew they had the real thing. And so I would, I, like I played on several recordings in Los Angeles, some Motown and some other acts. Like I played on I'll Be There, Never Can Say Goodbye, and a couple other ones by the Jackson Five, Thelma Houston's Don't Leave Me This Way. And I also played uh, Little Richard's King of Rock and Roll and Aretha's U album. I also played Carnegie Hall with Aretha. I played quite a bit of sessions. I, I would say three sessions a day in, in Los Angeles at that time. Recording here in Los Angeles was very much happening all the time right all day and, and all night and there was lots of work plus you got paid a double and triple scale so it, it was a real good situation now however I, i'm a session player but i'm still also an artist and so i'm looking for artistic things so at that time i start calling around a couple of my friends now i call Michael Henderson, who was playing bass for Miles Davis, he and I are close friends, he's from Detroit, and, and we're, in fact, we have the same birthday, and he's playing with Miles, and so I asked him if he knew of anything that was going on, anybody looking for something, and he said, yeah, they've had about 40 cats try out for the Tony Williams Lifetime, and, and that includes Jocko and Jeff Berlin. Wow. And so Michael talked to Ralph Armstrong, who was playing with John McLaughlin in the Maya Drishna, mm -hmm. and uh, both of them told Tony about me. I sent uh, them a, a cassette tape of different clips of songs that I'd played on. Then they sent for me, 
And I went to New York, and the rest is history, <laughs> as, as we would say, as far as the lifetime goes, right? It was an amazing experience. Well, l let's talk about this, because it's very important, and a lot of bass players seem to uh, not un understand that. Now, Jocko and Jeff Berlin, a lot of these guys, they, they solo their ass off. But when it comes to playing a pocket or a groove, it's another thing. And Tony says that for where he talks about how he put the group together and why he, he chose me. Because Tony's ambidextrous, so he needs somebody to lay it down so he can do his thing and be free. Yeah. Not yeah. the guy that's playing a bunch of notes and all of that's happening because between him and Holsworth, uh, Alan Holsworth, <laughs> there was enough notes flying yeah. all over the place, right? But it, it, what I really liked about being in the lifetime, Tony wouldn't tell us what to play. We would just strike a groove and then play things. But then when we took a break, you see everybody break, bring in a couple of songs when we get back together because mm -hmm. we both to record. And that's when all of us were Trekkies. One night I'm watching Star Trek and whoop, 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 and the red alert sound comes on. Oh, and it gave me an idea. Uh, right, okay, so I'm going to write, uh, so I wrote Red Alert. And, <laughs> and Snake Oil for the, the Believe It album, uh, right? And then I wrote three more for the Million Dollar Legs. You did it to me, baby, Inspirations of Love. Playing with Tony was a, a, a very new experience because I'd never played with anyone with that many, that much chops uh, right between him and Holsworth. So mm -hmm. it was a total creative situation that the chemistry worked very well between all of us. It was immediate. Because uh, when I first got there, it was just Alan Holsworth and Tony and myself. Then Alan Passwell came in from uh, Berkeley and he had found him. We did quite a few dates. Now, one of the reasons a lot of people, uh, this is a secret, but not so much a secret, but it, it's definitely a technique. We decided, and Tony decided, that before we recorded, believe it, that we would do a tour so that when we went into the studio, we wouldn't have to think about it. So we did three weeks of tours around New York playing these songs. So when we went into the CBS, Columbia Studio, if you record Believe It, they were damn near all first takes. <laughs> yeah. right? yeah. We had been practicing and playing them live for the past three weeks. And so that's one of the reasons why I believe the record is still popular and timeless to this day. It's because Tony had the awareness to, to put that out there that we would go play these gigs three weeks uh, and, and play the music before we record. So we, that's Believe It. Then Me and Our Legs, we recorded at uh, Chicago's Caribou Ranch uh, outside of Denver. And so that one we did the normal way. Uh, but but we got there and then put the songs together and then worked it all out and and, and recorded right. So it, it eventually what happened uh, I didn't know but the budget or the money ran out for the group and mm -hmm. I didn't find that out until the last gig we did at some gig in in San Francisco and I learned later that Alan had to, Alan Holsworth had to pawn his guitar to, to get back to England. Oh no. And, and it, right. Now I'm, I'm close to San Francisco because that's where the gig was. I'm in LA. So it, it wasn't a problem for me getting home, but I was, I was, I learned later that Pasqua and Holsworth were stuck there. And so I don't know how that could have even happened, right? Right where the and and we were with Nat Weiss management, and he managed uh, 
Return of Forever and, and Maya Vishnu and, 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 and these groups that, and Stanley. So I don't know how all of that happened, but that was more or less the end of, of, of the group, right? After that happened, I said, well, okay, I might as well start doing my thing, my own thing. So I recorded Mysticism and Romance. That's my first recording in 78. Been recording my own thing since then. I still do uh, recordings and sessions with other artists, but I also do my own artistic thing. Right? Nice. But in the meantime, I don't want to forget this, is while I'm in LA, in between the, the, the lifetime and, and me doing my own album, I went back to school for theory and composition and piano because I wanted to be uh, as good as any composer in history and I wanted to study all of them and, and learn from them, which I did. I went to Los Angeles City College and got a scholarship to Mount St. Mary's for my discovery. I have a discovery of a quantum quartal harmony, whereas I found 15,000 new chords as opposed to the tertian harmony, which we all use now, uh, which only has 13,000 chords. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself one day, I was writing this book, composing at the piano, I know there's other sounds out there. So I meditated on it for uh, a couple of weeks. And then the answer, I was driving down the street one day and my intuition says go into this used bookstore. So I had already done a lot of research because when I was meditating, uh, the answer also said that the answer is in the overtone series. And so, but any book that comes from America uh, only goes up to the 11th harmonic. And so I went into this used bookstore and they had this book by Ebenezer Prout. It was a theory and composition book, but he was from England. And yet it started off showing the overtone series up to the 16th. Now, far as I'm concerned, Everyone, they need to switch the system over here and you and start teaching you, just like they do in England, the overtone series first before you get into theory. Because once you study the overtone series, then you understand music in a lot greater way and you can hear more sensitive and you're more aware because you are aware of the overtone series. So. In the overtone series, the first notes are octave, fifth, and a fourth, and then the third start. So as I'm sitting at the piano, just experimenting, and then I start making some chords, stacking chords of fifths and fourths. I say, oh, this is a whole nother world here. And so then I had to organize it so that it can make sense. Now, everyone is, is uh, familiar with consonants and dissonance. And at that time, I was composing uh, with color and tension. And so they know about consonants and dissonance. And so that means consonants are stable chords and, and dissonant ones are unstable chords. So I bought in a middle ground called transonance which is passing chords. Now using these quintal, quintal are chords built of fifths, and quartal are chords are built, built of fourths. Now McCord, Tyner, and Keith Jarrett were playing these types of chords, and I don't know if you know about Hindemith. Beethoven was writing in fifths on his deathbed, right? right. A lot of, so, he had also plugged into that sound. Of course, we have Debussy and, and, and Schoenberg and, and other people, but nobody really did as much homework as, as I did. And uh, I said that's how I was able, and I worked with the astrophysicists, but we came up with, that's how we found that it was 15,000 of, of these chords and all of the 
combinations that you could come up with, right? Just like in, in regular music, a one, three, five, seven, nine, it's a ninth chord. Well, there's no three or sevens in the quintal or quarter. It's like a one, five, or nine, a one, two, uh, five, or, or, or six chord, like an A quintal over a C quintal. Or you can use the quintal and the quartal together, but you were not used. You can use tertian chords along with these chords with the quintal and quartal harmony. Now I call it Nova Phonics because I, I had to come up with a name that was easily understood. And so the reason why these chords are so effective is because after the third fifth, all of the harmonics synchronize themselves from the ninth up, and it gives the sound a tremendous resonance and, and richness, uh, right? That's why when you hear these, normally, let's say, most people only knew about Gregorian chant. Okay, Gregorian chant, if they understood it, uh, they used two fifths and fourths, but they never used three or more, whereas <laughs> I used three to twelve fifths and, and fourths to come up with all of these chordal combinations. I think my, my first piece, well, my, my first piece is, is on, uh, it's on YouTube, it's, it's called Romance or Star Romance. And, but I play piano with that. Because when I went back to school to study theory and composition, I also studied piano. <laughs> and so I still kept my bass chops up, but I went back to piano because, as I told you, my neighbor had a piano, which I would go over there and really practice. But after I got into bass and all of the woodwinds, I never did play the piano that much. So this was a return to the piano, which I'm, I'm still playing to this day, both piano and, and bass. We're, we're at the lifetime and we're, we're at the Nova Phonics. Then uh, I think uh, about 1979, 1980, I get a call from Mark Nassif, who's playing with Gary Moore. And so they say they're putting a group together, and they had heard my work from the Lifetime and, and the Motown. And so we got together and we formed G Force. That's with Gary Moore. So that was my all the way rock situation, uh, right? That was another. Every act and every type of music that I play, I tune into where it's coming from. It, 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 in fact, somebody asked me, how could I play so many different types of music? And so my response is, well, I was taught by doing so many sessions in Detroit, as, as well as Jameson, that first of all, you play what the music needs, right? You tune into the music, and you tune into the artists, what they need. Mm -hmm. So you're always tuned into that right place where you're not playing the wrong thing or the wrong style. You're playing absolute what's perfect for that particular song and that particular artist, right? Now, if you notice, Jameson is playing all throughout Motown. He never repeats a damn thing, right? <laughs> He's always flowing. And he changes up on the uh, on the music and the notes that he's playing, and he's flowing, being creative, but within the context of uh, like he doesn't play the same way with the Supremes as he does with the Temptations or or the Vandellas, or he does not play the same with any of the artists or any of the music. It's all different and has its own flowing, and that was. Jameson's real genius. He, I mean, he was a genius, no doubt, and master, but you can actually hear this when you listen to a lot of the music, and that's why he, people still listen to him to these days, to this day, 
because his music was, the way he played, was so creative and it fit the song and made the song happen, right? And, and, and in those days, the bass, electric bass specifically, made quite a difference, right? See, we're up to, okay, Gary Moore and G Force. So that group, we did a tour opening for White Snake, and that tour was, like I said, about 1980. But Gary and the lead singer, Willie D, they didn't seem to get along, so the group did. We did one record, G Force. A lot of people have heard it over here, but it wasn't really released over here, it was released in England. So then after that situation dissipates, then I go back and, oh, okay, that's after, that was around 1980, but I still go back to uh, doing my own music a after that. But I'm still playing with other people, but I'm still concentrating on composing uh, and, and, and playing my own music as well. And, yeah. yeah, needless to say, obviously there was a whole ton of Motown, there's a whole big body of work afterwards, uh, yeah. L.A. touring worldwide. Yeah. I mean, you've been all over the place, and yeah. a lot of your own creative stuff, I know that you've been working on a, a movie that's yeah. going to get released here in the near future. Tell us a little bit about that. Cause it... Oh, okay. So the movie is called Mars Quest. Now, a lot of people don't know Gustav Holtz. Gustav Holtz was an early 1900s composer, and he wrote The Planets. All of the orchestras play the, the suite called The Planets. Mm -hmm. And so within The Planets, there's Mars. Ba, 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 that particular motto. Now, it bugs the shit out of me because John Williams literally takes some of Gustav Holtz's stuff and puts it in his stuff when the man's a good enough composer, we call it theme and variation. You don't need to steal anything from anybody. You just make a theme and variation or let it inspire you in a different way. Not take just like, he'll take that and put it in his music like he created that, mm -hmm. right? As well as... This music is not based on tertian harmony, it's third harmony. So, Mars Quest is about humanity's quest to discover Mars. So, I start from Galileo all the way up to Elon Musk, to, to today's space travel, right? And, and so, the story is told through the music. I do not do a soundtrack. I call it the soundscape. I put all of the music together, then I put the images with the music, mm -hmm. not the other way uh, around. So the story is told through music, and uh, I found images through various websites, including NASA, and then I, I used various techniques one of the things I learned in school was how to video edit. <laughs> so I was able to put, I, I did the work of about 10 people putting the movie together. And so there's parts of the movie where it's jazz music, there's parts of the movie where there's text on the screen, like Star Wars, then some that have a voice over. I use every technique to keep the flow going along throughout the whole movie because no one has ever created a movie in this particular style. I was trying to decide whether I wanted to have the movie released by a company like Sony or I would release it on the internet. And r right now I'm thinking about the internet, but I'm also talking to a a few other companies, so we'll see it, how it works out. Okay. But it's going to be any time now that the movie will be released. And I'm very happy about the, the film because it seems everyone that watches the movie and listens to it recognizes that the music is telling the story. 
And so that was my goal, is to tell the story through music. And the music is all the Nova Phonics, Quindle, and Quarrel Harmony throughout the, uh, the whole film, right? So I could have that rich new sound and it would grab your attention as soon as you, you heard it. I start off with the Gustav Holtz Mars piece, and then I go into all, all of my pieces, right? And so I'm, I'm very ecstatic and happy. It was a lot of work. It took me maybe eight months to put the whole thing together. Wow. Uh, but I, I'm very happy about the result. Nice. Well, it gives us something to look forward to. Another yeah. thing I wanted to talk about, a lot of our readers are familiar with bite guitars. Yeah. And one of the strengths of those great folks, Wolfgang and the good guys there at Byte, is yeah. that you can put together a custom bass yeah. the way you want it. And yeah. a lot of it is the usual uh, things that people are looking for, but they've got a signature bass. Yeah. And, and it's called the Punchtown bass that you worked in collaboration with them. Tell us about this bass. Okay, the, the Punchtown bass is more or less a bass that's modeled after the precision bass at, used at Motown. It, it's, it's that sound and that time. Only they've added a mute on the bridge, a three times mute, uh, where there's off, soft, and mute it all the way. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, a really great thing to have because then you don't have to hold your hand on the bridge trying to mute the strings, right? Mm -hmm. So we were trying to go for the Motown sound then, even though a lot of people don't understand this as well. In those days, Jameson taught me this. Anyway, the strings are about... Uh, First of all, there were flat wounds in those days, but they were also about a quarter of an inch off of uh, the fretboard, right? And so, obviously, he was playing, first Jameson played tuba, and then he played upright, and so from the upright, that's where uh, the strings being that far up off of the neck came from so you get a gut punchy sound okay. uh, right and so w we have it set up so that you can get the motown sound from the punch town i'm going to say put some bite in your sound <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. that's going to be my theme for the bass right and the neck the body it's a fantastic bass and I also understand they they've got a reverse pickup position and uh, yes, wide right. range tone pots so that that helps get that sound yes well we're still working on the tone because in my days the tone it was a wide range if you get like a 60s p bass if you go from treble to bass you can hear quite a bit of difference in the sound you hear treble and then you hear bass without it being too muddy. So we're going to adjust the capacitors so that we can get that actual sound. But the bass is good to yeah. use in all kinds of music, just like, of course, the P bass yeah. is, right? And a lot of people like the jazz bass because of, of the two pickups, right, and the two, two positions. Mm -hmm. But in general, the P bass was the one that was on the most recordings at that time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and still is, I would think. It has a unique sound that's not too deep and not too high and very smooth for uh, making recordings. Nice, nice. Well, and I know a lot of people, it's, it's a real point of discussion, four string and extended range. And some of your work I've seen, you've been playing with the six string. Oh, oh yeah, I've been playing six string for, for many years. And when we first started talking to Wolfgang, I said, well, I, I, I only play six strings because I, I, I had a triple neck bass that the guy, Rex Bow made my golf with the guitar. He made one for me, but then it was heavy. And then when the six strings came out, because uh, I prefer the extended range. I like the low B and I, I like the, the high C. 
but Wolfgang said they didn't make any six strings, but we're going to work on a five string that's totally configured for me, right? The punch town bass will be the, the Motown sound, and then the five string will be the extended range one. Very cool. Well, it, so much exciting stuff. Tony, if people want to stay on top of what you're doing, they want to find out when the movie is going to get released and all yeah. this stuff, where's the best place for people to look? TonyNewtonMusic.com. Excellent. Uh, that's my website, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they can also search Tony Newton on YouTube as well. Okay, and you're on oh, social and, media, Facebook? And, and, uh, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> then they can go to Facebook, which is Tony Newton Music Artist. Well, now I have two groups. I have TNT Extreme and Soul Castle. TNT Extreme is my full group with the, the strings and all of that, and Soul Castle is a power trio. Nice. Uh, so it's really exciting to have both situations, and, and I'm writing all the time, uh, and so I just try to keep my creativity flowing and keep my chops going. There you go, there you go. Well, Tony, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us and share all of this knowledge. It's so great for us to be able to hear the story, what was going on. History is important. I think all bass players need to know where we came from. Right, right, right. Exactly. There you go. So thank you so much, folks. You've seen him here, Tony Newton on Bass Musician Magazine. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Keep playing that bass. <laughs> cool.